Our first reading today is from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If, the fam if a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of the first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. That same night, they must roast meat, roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs, and internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before morning. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry a walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you and when I strike, when I strike the land of Egypt. This is the day to remember. Each year, from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. This is a law for all time. The epistle reading for today is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans. Hear now the voice of the still speaking God in chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except love for one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. Besides this, you know what time it is. How it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of our Lord. Give thanks to God. Amen, everybody. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? All we need is love. All we need is love. All we need is love. Love is all we need. Amen. God's love equals faith in action. 
That's our theme for this year. Now, when I say faith in action, I'm not just referring to prayers said on the football field for a ball to go through the uprights, though that is certainly faith in action of a sort. And I'm not speaking of prayerful action in the stands when parents are praying their child will not be hurt by that 290-pound high school linebacker. <laughs> Nor am I speaking of that student praying before the dreaded pop quiz that answers will pop into their heads even though they haven't studied a lick. But on this homecoming Sunday 2017, I want to talk about how God's love equals faith in action in our confusing and often chaotic world and how God's love applies to welcoming anybody who is a body, no matter who they are or where they are on their life's journey. My sisters and brothers, could we be blessed with a more timelier theme? Because we live in a time when being welcomed home to God's love seems extra challenging. And I know that many of you have been shaking your heads in dismay or widening your eyes in disbelief or feeling your heart race with anxiety and fear at the almost daily conflicts we witness and experience in these tough and testing times. And I know you've wondered where is God's love when there is so much hatred, so much anger, and so much negativity in our world. But homecoming, homecoming is about love and about being love and about loving others as God loves us and as we ought to love ourselves. I think you would agree that our call to come home to God's love has been challenged this year. How can we, in the face of the hatred and the tragedies we've witnessed recently, welcome into our hearts those whom we so fervently disagree with and because we so disagree with who they are and what they believe, we've learned to despise. We've witnessed the very opposite of God's love equaling faith in action on television, telephones, tablets, and for some, and for some in old-fashioned newspapers. Think about the images and words in the once peaceful little university town of Charlottesville, Virginia, when we witnessed, not figuratively, but literally, the torch-lit faces of rage, and from the mouths of some of those faces, we heard words spoken, words furiously shouted, that we thought were part of our history, the way we were, not who we are today. Perhaps like me, you've been disheartened and dismayed to hear words spoken perversely in the name of Jesus Christ. And perhaps you've wept as symbols of hate were waved from murky depths of fury, and as we witnessed not faith in action, but hate in action, not words of welcome to all, but the very opposite. Words like, get out, go back to where you came from. You are not welcomed here at all. And we were witnesses to something many of us never thought we would witness again, what many of us thought was beyond question in our beloved nation. I'm reminded of the poem I learned as a third grader in New York City, it is the poem inscribed on the bronze plaque on the Statue of Liberty, written by a 34-year-old Jewish American woman named Emma Lazarus. Emma Lazarus. Miss Lazarus, quite a name for a woman whose words raised up to new life so many. A little known fact is that Emma Lazarus did not want to write the sonnet that for over a century has welcomed millions to their new home in the United States of America. Emma Lazarus did not want to compose the poem that now bears her name. But Emma Lazarus changed her mind when she was drawn to the plight of immigrants to America. Her words, words that I hope we never take for granted, speak to our theme of God's love and our faith in action and our welcome to all, no matter who they are or where they are on their life's journey. The poem on the statue reads, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse from your teeming shores send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. These are words that have helped define our nation and our national consciousness. Words that encourage us to embrace the diversity of our faiths. Words which have welcomed to their new home for more than a century millions of immigrants. And lately we have learned for God is always teaching us that we cannot take these words for granted, but that we must fight 
to make these words a reality, not with fists and fury or with weapons of mass destruction, but with love, with faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the love we are called to put into action. <clears throat> I know it isn't easy to open our hearts to those whom we disagree with, those whose belief we find so despicable. But an unknown fact about Emma Lazarus is that she did not want to write a poem to help raise money for the Statue of Liberty. But Emma Lazarus changed her mind when she was convinced by the sufferings of others. Think about that for a moment. She changed her mind when she thought of the sufferings of others. And her poem changed the way the world looked at our nation and the way we look at ourselves. And so that mass demonstration of hate in Charlottesville, the tragedy of nature's fury visited on our brothers and sisters in Texas, Florida, and elsewhere around the world, the calling into question, the words on one of our most treasured national monuments, these things try our faith in humanity and for some, our faith in God. And yet, we've been here before <clears throat> and always. Always the answer to the question of what can we do is always the same. We must translate the words of our faith into actions that demonstrate God's love, not just for some, but for everyone. That is why I love the words of our text from Exodus on this 10th day of the month of September that reads, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation that this is a day to remember and to celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord for all time. This text speaks of new beginnings, about leaving behind the things of this world and preparing for the new life we have in God. It tells God's people, this time is for you, and that to arrive at the future God has promised the people of God, they must first leave the past behind. And this day marks the beginning of their future and freedom. And know this, time for God's people is and forevermore freedom time. And in Paul's letter to the church in Rome, Paul says, owe no one anything except to love one another. And Paul challenges us to love others as we ought to love ourselves. My sisters and brothers, our world presents us with crystal clear pictures of our challenges. How can we love those who spew hate at those who don't look like them, think like them, believe like them, speak like them, or even smell like them? How can we love those on the far right, waving Nazi and Confederate flags in anger, or those on the far left who believe violence is an acceptable way to achieve their goals, or religious radicals and fanaticals whose perverted views of their faith include hate and violence? How do we reconcile with the God of love, the hurricanes, floods, and natural disasters in our nation and around the world? How do we come to terms with someone who questions the validity of the meaning of the words we pledge that we will be one nation under God with liberty and justice for all? Well, I say we find the answer in the good news we have of God's love in Jesus Christ which teaches us how God's love must be translated into faith in action. Jesus said, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For God makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And God sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Norfield, if we open our eyes and hearts, we will find evidence of God's love everywhere even in tough and testing times. We've seen it in those first responders and those everyday citizens helping their neighbors and strangers in and around Houston. A diversity of people from a diversity of places, beliefs, and backgrounds were putting their lives on the line to rescue those in need, helping us to see and know as a nation how God's love looks. And it is a reminder for us that we are not just a nation of hopeless division, because what we witnessed in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey strengthens our faith in each other. But what do we do about the others? Those who seem so full of hate, those who seek a nation closed off to those perceived as different because of whom they choose to love, how they choose to worship, or what language they speak. 
Well, the good news is that we have the blueprint as to how to love those whom we find most revolting. The good news is that we have God's word as a blueprint. The Apostle Paul reminds us of the words of Christ, that we put God's love into action when we love one another as God loves each and every one of us. And I know that friendships and families have been torn apart because of the political and societal divisions that some say are as sharp, as sharp and as deep as they have ever been at any time in our history. Some have called it a new civil war. Well, if that is true on any level, we can thank God for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which tells us whoever says he is in the light and hates his sister or brother is still living in darkness. So that friend, that sibling, that parent, or that child from whom you are estranged and you have come to loathe because of something they said or did or their religious or political views or for reasons you can't even remember now is the very person or persons we need to welcome home and welcome into our hearts. How, you may ask, can you welcome them? Well, begin by bringing them to church. That, of course, would be my preference. <laughs> but OK, if church isn't the answer yet, you can offer a kind word to comfort their hurting heart, which just might be hurting like yours from your broken relationship. Have a cup of coffee with them or write a letter a real letter on real paper, which these days would be a grand gesture, and let them know you miss the relationship. You know we live in some of the most turbulent and angriest of times, but here is a blessed assurance I can give you today. To be not dismayed, whatever be tied, whatever the case, that is to say no matter what is happening in and around us, God is going to take care of us. And we know that because God's son Jesus, endured derision, hate, scorn, betrayal, and ultimately death because he was willing to remain faithful to the God who loved him. And God loved him. And God loves us. And because God so loved us, we can't help but to put our faith into action. And Northfield, I hope you will continue to put your faith into action by making the commitment to make Northfield the church God wants us to be. Because this church, your church, our church, needs willing workers to commit to our children, our discovery hour, our music makers ministry, our outreach activities, our prayer ministry team. This church needs you to pledge during our stewardship campaign and to give not till it hurts, but till it feels just right. We are blessed to call this church our family. And so my sisters and brothers, I say to you on this homecoming Sunday, Welcome home, and let's get busy for God.